good morning, everyone. You don't have to be so far away. You come in closer. Thank you all for being here. Last month, we celebrated the signing of the transportation bill, which focused on our commitment to improving Vermont's infrastructure. Today, uh, we're here to highlight some additional initi initiatives from this bill, which directly relate to electric vehicles and our emission goals. We know that chimneys and tailpipes are the biggest contributors to carbon emissions, which is why we focus our efforts on helping Vermonters adopt cleaner technologies in these two areas. We also know the transportation sector is the largest of the two, accounting for around 45% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. To do our part, Vermont, across multiple administrations, has set and worked towards specific goals one of which is to increase the share of renewable energy in our transportation sector to 10% by 2025 and 80% by 2050. This will require about 50,000 plug-in electric vehicles registered in Vermont six years from today. While today we have a little over 3,000 vehicles, EV vehicles registered. So it's clear we have a long ways to go and a lot of ground to make up. In my budget address, I said I believe we can meet these goals, but to do so, we must help people make the transition. And I believe incentives are the best way to do so. So I'm pleased to have worked with the legislature, some of many of whom are here today, to invest 1.1 million from this year's T-bill to support an EV incentive program. This is a purchase and lease rebate program that applies to new EVs. It's geared towards helping low to moderate income Vermonters, so it's limited to households at or below 160% of median household income, or about 92,000. It's also limited to EVs with a base price of $40,000 or less. The incentive program will help low and moderate middle income Vermonters benefit from vehicle electrification and share their, and, and as we see more people transition uh, to EVs and share their experiences with their neighbors, I believe this word of mouth education will help increase use beyond the scope of this program. These incentives can also be combined with those from federal programs and electric utility initiatives which will help further lower the costs and increase the number of EVs on the road. Electric vehicles are also proving to be less expensive to maintain, and the technology has come a long ways in just a few short years to offer a variety of vehicle options. Electrifying the transportation sector will help clean the air and keep millions of dollars within our economy. And while work, uh, more work needs to be done, Vermont has taken strong steps uh, towards a renewable transportation sector. Accelerating vehicle electrification will continue to be a priority of my administration. So I'm now pleased to invite uh, BGS Deputy Commissioner Jennifer Fitch to discuss an initiative also from the T-Bill that will help the state lead by example and expand the number of EVs in our state fleet. Jennifer. Good morning. Um, as Governor Scott noted in his budget address earlier this year, the state can lead by example, and we are excited to propose initiatives that do just that. The transportation bill requires that not less than 50% of vehicles purchased and leased by the Department of Buildings and General Services be hybrid and plug-in vehicles, and not less than 75% beginning on July 1st, 2021. This year's appropriation bill steers $512,000 to electrifying the state's motor pool. These expenditures will support the purchase of 12 fully electric vehicles and four additional charging stations throughout the state of Vermont. The transportation bill also authorizes state agencies to set and adjust fees for the use of their charging equipment. This will enable Vermont agencies to make their fleet charging infrastructure available to their employees and the public while making the taxpayers whole for the use of this equipment. This fee setting authority will also help these agencies enter into public private partnerships with electric vehicle charging providers. Next, Secretary Flynn will share additional electrification efforts included in this year's T-Bill. 
Thank you, Jennifer, and good morning, everybody. The transportation bill establishes requirements for charging equipment available to the public to help improve the consumer's charging experience. Publicly available charging equipment must disclose all charges and provide multiple payment options without requiring a subscription fee. The transportation bill gives the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets jurisdiction over charging infrastructure available to the public as part of its overall responsibility for weights and measures in Vermont. The agency will ensure that customers know what they are paying for and will allow electric vehicle motorists to compare charging prices. The transportation bill also authorizes to support an incentive program as the governor mentioned. At the recommendation of the Public Utility Commission, the transportation bill removes PUC and the Public Service Department jurisdiction over charging infrastructure. This will facilitate growth of commercial charging stations in Vermont and allow charging stations to charge fees by the kilowatt hour, which is the most transparent way to charge for charging. The bill also allows time charges at charging infrastructure, which may be necessary in some settings to encourage electric vehicle motorists to move their vehicles once their charging sessions are complete. The transportation bill asks the Public Utility Commission to continue investigating the best methods to collect highway user fees from electric vehicles. Like combustion vehicles, electric vehicles are subject to purchase and use tax and registration fees. However, electric vehicles do not pay motor fuel taxes, and electric vehicles continue to gain in market share, the state will need to make up for lost motor vehicle fuel taxes in order to keep the transportation fund whole. Although some states are looking into highway user fee base on a vehicle miles traveled approach, we don't think this approach raises the host or this approach does raise a host of complicated issues relating to interstate apportionment and many other concerns. The most workable approach is to add a fee to the cost of charging, including home charging, to be collected by the distribution utility, along with other taxes and fees that already apply. This approach is technologically workable and combined with the favorable rates that apply to EV charging will ensure charging fees do not disincentivize consumers from driving electric vehicles. I encourage the PUC to work with the legislature on establishing a fee system based on per kilowatt hour charges to give utilities and regulators time to adjust to this new framework before lost revenues from electric vehicle electrification become a significant financial issue. Now I'd like to introduce ANR Deputy Secretary Peter Walk, who will provide an update on the work that we're doing with the VW settlement funds. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and good morning. Today marks a significant day for our move towards lower vehicle emissions, not simply because of the increase in incentive availability to Vermonters, but because of all the other steps that we are taking today to make EVs more accessible and easier to use for all Vermonters. For example, the state of Vermont continues to invest its share of the VW settlement money, which comes from that manufacturer's use of emissions testing defeat devices to further vehicle electrification. So far, the state has granted $1 million in funding for 30 charging stations across Vermont, including both level two and level three, the fast charging stations and we will dedicate additional funds to ensure that nearly every Vermonter is not farther than 30 miles from a fast charging station. In addition to the new 30 charging stations, which will come online over the next year, Vermont currently has 26 fast charging stations and 191 level two charging stations. Our network is vast and growing. We're also using VW funds to launch a pilot project that will help us better understand how to integrate new busing technology into our fleet. We have unique climate needs, unique topography, unique road systems that we need to figure out how to use electric buses in that environment. And with a pilot project we will launch, we'll bring four school buses and two, two transit buses to, the, to Vermont to better understand that work so that we can 
roll it out for all Vermonters and make it available for everybody in a way that gets through those growing pains quickly. Additionally, VTrans has secured funding for four additional transit buses. With, with the robust charging network already in place and more charging stations coming online, with electric vehicles and a variety of incentives and a variety of electric vehicle models, now is a great time to begin to think about purchasing an electric vehicle. I would encourage all Vermonters, whether they're looking for a new or a new to them vehicle, to take a look at the EV models available today and the ones that will be available to Vermonters in the coming years to see whether or not those vehicles meet their needs and understand how they work and how they're different and how they're better and save you money so that you can be thinking as your next vehicle purchase comes online to whether an EV is right for you. I do want to make a quick note that we're acting independently and in partnership with other states because the federal government is not taking the needed action to assist with this transition. The polls roll back the CAFE standards, which dictate overall fuel efficiency for our automobile fleet is the wrong approach. Repealing California's waiver to set strong air emission standards, which Vermont follows, is the wrong approach. Vermont has and will continue to fight against these moves because it harms Vermonters and it makes Vermonters spend more money on fuel. We will continue this fight through the U.S. Climate Alliance, which now represents 24 governors, 55% of the U.S. population, and 60% of our economy. These governors are standing up and saying, this is not the appropriate action. We need to continue this fight. Rolling back our standards is not the way to do it. Thank you very much for coming today. With that, I'll hand it back to the governor. Well, again, thank you very much uh, for coming. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you might have or find somebody behind me that can answer those as well. One question. Uh, we're supposed to have 50 to 60,000 electric vehicles on the road by 2020. That's only 6% of the way towards that goal. Did we set a goal that is realistic? I believe it's a, you know, you always have to set goals uh, that are not easily obtained. Uh, but I believe we can, uh, we can get there. Uh, but it's going to take all of us uh, working together. I believe the incentives will help do that. Uh, but also technology. I mean, think back about uh, not too long ago. When we, we talked about electric vehicles, we talked about Priuses, mostly just Priuses, a hybrid. Uh, and today, uh, there's a vast, wide variety of electric vehicles out there, many of them fully, fully electric, uh, Tesla being one. And it's really changed the whole dynamic. And, uh, and I believe that we'll see uh, the trajectory won't be even. It won't be uh, a, straight, uh, a straight approach. It's going to ramp up. Uh, incredibly fast and we've seen that even over the last two or three years so I'm looking forward to it uh, I believe it's obtainable and uh, and I believe that Vermont is ready for it. Can you give a ballpark figure for what the annualized fee would be for the average driver who would now be paying this uh, kilowatt hour surcharge? I, I can't uh, I don't have one uh, and I can I can refer to someone else but I will say this uh, there are many, uh, you know, we pay a fee now, a per gallon fee. Uh, I would not expect it to exceed that. So we're already paying uh, that amount of money. And with the cost of EVs uh, becoming more acceptable, um, this could be, there's a cost savings uh, to electric vehicles. And I don't believe that this will be uh, a significant increase. But if anyone else has anything else they'd like to add to that, TJ Poor from the Public Service Department, and, and just add to that, uh, the governor is correct that the uh, and any initial fee would be relatively small and not uh, in, in not become a barrier to adoption of electric vehicles. Uh, it's critically important that we continue to fund our uh, transportation infrastructure, but uh, we we want to make it so that uh, customers contribute to that, but are also very much encouraged to, to uh, switch to electricity for their transportation needs. The Public Uti Utility Commission is, uh, as part of their report, recommended another study by December. We'll have a lot more detail on, uh, on what that fee should be, how to collect it, and uh, uh, and how to implement it. Is the, is the general thinking that that fee should uh, approximate what people would otherwise be paying? 
buy the gas tank? Uh, it, it's to su support the infrastructure in an equitable way. Uh, so we wanted to, to ensure that the electric vehicles are contributing to roads and bridges and, uh, and to uh, continue to, uh, to continue to make those investments and keep that whole, the, those funds whole. And yeah. do you plan to have legislation ready to go in January? Well, we'll work together in order to do that. Yes, I, I believe that we should, uh, we should prepare ourselves. And I believe that everyone needs to pay their fair share in terms of uh, maintaining our infrastructure, improving our infrastructure. Uh, we've seen uh, over the years, uh, many people are, are sensitive uh, to that. So uh, we don't want it to be a barrier. Uh, we certainly, uh, but we, we just want to make sure it's equitable for all users of the highway. what is being considered and being looked at. So just to be clear, there is no fee being announced today. Uh, this is about an amazing incentive that actually is already on top of other incentives that the distribution utilities are doing. So I think this is an amazing day for electric vehicle transportation in Vermont. So first and foremost. Second, it is cheaper to, char to power your car with electricity than gas. So even as this is considered, and if there is a fee that comes down the road, it is still going to be cheaper to power your transportation with electricity. So again, I think that's what's really exciting because we're doing incentives. BED has an amazing incentive. Uh, VEC has an incentive. So I think this is really, as the governor said, about ramping up adoption of clean transportation that can help us with our carbon problem. But we'll be ready and we'll participate and we'll respond in any way that's appropriate as this issue is considered of how to take care of our roads and bridges at the same time. So do you think it should have been, though, on a miles-driven approach? I, I don't have an opinion on how it should be. I'm really glad that they're putting together this group uh, and, and this process, I should say, putting together a process to have it looked at to make sure that we're using best practices of other states, other countries that are looking at this issue and coming up with the smartest, most affordable way to do it for Vermonters. That's what we'll be focused on. Mary, if Vermont were to hit that 50,000 EV goal by 2025, do you know how much that would increase power usage on your base? Your yeah, base? for sure. We've looked a lot at the strategic electrification, not just of transportation, but of home heating. Because as you all know, our real carbon problem in Vermont is transportation and heating. So we've been looking at this issue for years and years and years as we are fully engaged in the battle against uh, climate change. So yes, we've looked at that. The really cool thing about the transformation that's happening is a lot of people actually are charging at home. And a lot of people are interested in partnering with us on charging infrastructure that allows us to collaborate with you on when you charge your vehicle. So you might get home, you might plug in, right? and then you don't want to think about it for the rest of the evening. And so the good news is, if you're working with us as an example on that charging infrastructure, we make sure that your vehicle is charging when the costs on the grid are the lowest and when it is the most useful from a strategic electrification perspective. So our vision of the future is, you know, dramatic, like kick carbon to the curb and do that in a way that allows us to use the electricity infrastructure in a way that makes it more and more affordable for the future. But yeah, we've looked at, at the numbers. Um, I don't have them top of mind, but we can follow up on how much that would add and how we would manage that load. But, but, but are we talking like, would it double the amount of power that you Oh or? my goodness, no. Okay. No. Oh my goodness, no. No. Not at all. Not at all. And, and remember that Vermonters at the same time are moving towards strategic distributed generation, largely solar. So we have been actually losing load over the last 15 years. So, so Green Mountain Power actually sells less power today than we did 13 years ago. So, so we really see if this is done in a, in a strategic way, which it is being done in that way, um, it can really help to manage the electric infrastructure in a way that's incredibly affordable. 
that good? Well, how good are the incentives now? And do they only, especially with this new ones that were just uh, included in the T bill, and does, do they only apply to purchase or purchase or lease? Well, purchase and lease, right? Yeah, exactly. And and again, we're thrilled because what we found is, um, again, it's being looked at all over the country, all over the world. What moves people to electric vehicles? What we found with the Vermonters we serve, which is a lot of them, eight, you know, 78 percent of Vermont, we found that the upfront incentive drives it more than anything else. So we are so excited that this is going to happen on top of other existing incentive infrastructure that we have. Um, so I really believe in that adoption, as the governor does. I really believe we can get to 50,000. In fact, I actually hope we get to a lot more than that, because once the flywheel turns, uh, I think Vermonters will move forward in technology that is way more sophisticated than the fossil-based technology that a lot of Vermonters are still using today. And I think the, uh, the incentives that uh, we've mentioned before, uh, we had, uh, I think there was a press conference maybe a year or two ago, at Burlington Electric, and uh, they have provided incentives as well, along with uh, Green Mountain Power, uh, along with uh, some of the manufacturers and, and the tax credits from the federal government. And you could buy a Nissan Leaf for somewhere around $10,000 brand new. Um, so those are the types of incentives we're looking for uh, that make it affordable for everyday Vermonters to, to be able to transition in, in this respect. And, and I do think, uh, I think, uh, Mary made a, a great point in terms of charging the independence this provides, not relying on others, uh, energy in, independence in some respects, because you could, uh, you could uh, charge right from home. Uh, most people don't drive more than uh, a couple hundred miles during a day, uh, and uh, they could charge at home and come back that very next night and recharge uh, without, without going to any, uh, any other uh, charging infrastructure. But battery technology has changed dramatically. And that's going to continue to improve with lithium batteries and so forth. Longer life, faster charging. This is all things we're going to be seeing in the next few years, and it's going to be a dramatic increase uh, as uh, technology changes. Is the governor's car going electric? What's that? Is the governor's car going electric? <laughs> uh, eventually, uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I believe it, it is the future. It's very exciting. Uh, the uh, the amount of torque uh, and the the in the uh, an electric vehicle is uh, is really impressive and and i look forward to that i got one more car question for you not related to electric are you racing tonight uh, not tonight no uh they postponed actually uh until <laughs> until tomorrow night so uh, i hope to uh, hope to race tomorrow night we'll see what does eventually mean eventually <laughs> Well, I think, again, the more vehicles that uh, they come out with, uh, it's certainly in Vermont. I've seen some of the, the new uh, new companies that are evolving. Uh, Four-wheel drive, all-wheel all, uh, all drive uh, technology uh, will be, uh, I think, essential for our region of the country. Uh, and uh, as well, you know, pickup uh, trucks. I've seen a number of them. They're very exciting. SUVs are going to be uh, part of that, uh, that new uh, the new uh, world, I think, and uh, when we see that, and again, we're seeing it every day, um, we'll be there. Uh, I just want to make it a point. Uh, our committee, our transportation committee in the Senate, spent a lot of time on this this past winter. I knew nothing about electric vehicles. I don't know that much more now, but the governor said I had to have a long extension cord to my car. Uh, but anyway, what we're focusing on is how to the revenue part, and I just that was brought up earlier. All we want to do is make the uh, kilowatts uh, equal to a gallon of gas. That way it's fair. Some people said, well, why don't you register registration at it? That wouldn't be fair because some people don't drive a lot of miles. If you want to make it equal to gasoline, just figure out what a gasoline, the tax revenue, put it electric, and then we can, we can focus on that. So that's our mission, and that's what we're, we're focusing on. So uh, we don't want to lose revenue either. we we got to pay for our highways. Thank you. Yeah, and that's again another good point and uh, it isn't uh, we aren't the only state faced with this uh, and we're seeing you know as uh, as uh, vehicles become more efficient even traditional vehicles uh, we see a decrease in the amount of uh, fuel tax that's, uh, that's uh, uh, accumulated so uh, we're going to have to do something about this on a national level uh, the other uh, governors I've spoken to at National Governors Association meetings are faced with the same problem. So uh, I believe this will be a, a national approach at some point. 
and uh, and we'll uh, we'll transition together on this. Your uh, your public utilities uh, uh, chair said recently that we need to be on a basically on a wartime footing to meet the challenges of climate change. Uh, are we on a wartime footing? Well, again, I think this is a ramped up approach. It's not going to be a straight linear line from now until 2050. I really believe as technology changes, as we've seen over the last, even just take the last two or three years, it's improved dramatically and we're going to see continued improvements. And, and with what Tesla has done uh, to the electric uh, vehicle market has been very impressive and inspiring to many. And, uh, and I believe that's what's going to precipitate change. Uh, it's going to be more acceptance at that point. Uh, and again, we provide incentives. The more your neighbor is driving, you see your neighbor driving one, uh, the more custom people, change is tough. Uh, but, uh, but I think that the more people who do it, and the more we get accustomed to this, uh, the, the more uh, the likelihood of us reaching our goal, uh, I believe that we, we, can, we can do that. And, and uh, I believe that we're on that path. See electric vehicle racing at Thunder Road someday? <laughs> I, yes, I absolutely believe that that will be the case uh, because I think a racer is a racer. Uh, yeah. They want to, uh, they'll race anything with wheels, and <laughs> regardless of the, what's powering it. So, Governor, it's a given that uh, global warming leads to extreme weather. Uh, this meeting and a lot of state policies focused on carbon reduction, but can the state of Vermont do more to protect people and property from extreme weather? What are the policies we have in place to uh, prevent the damage from a future Hurricane Irene? Yeah, well, again, reducing our carbon emissions will help do that. Uh, we've taken a lot of steps since Irene. I think Irene was a wake-up call for, for many of us. Uh, and we've taken steps uh, with a lot of our infrastructure throughout the state, whether it's uh, bridges and, and culverts and so forth, and upgrades to, uh, to be more prepared uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So. Uh, we've taken a lot of steps in that regard. Uh, we're in better shape than, than many states, uh, obviously, with our terrain uh, here in Vermont. But, uh, but we've taken a lot of steps uh, moving towards uh, having, being more prepared for what is inevitable uh, and what we need, to, uh, we need to address. And that's what we're addressing today, carbon emissions. Well, let's keep in mind, let's, uh, let's take this, uh, the positive uh, aspect of this. This is the second highest rating uh, that, that the bond uh, rating agencies give. Uh, so we're still the second highest. Uh, and we, uh, we sit uh, apart from many other states in that regard. We've done a good job in managing uh, some of our, our funds. We don't, uh, uh, we don't, uh, we don't have uh, other than our pensions and so forth, unfunded liabilities. We have a balanced budget without having a constitutional amendment to say that we have to. Uh, so we, we manage our money well. Um, they, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, with rating agencies this year, hours and hours and hours on the phone uh, with them making our case. They like what they see, uh, but they keep going back to it's your demographics. Uh, that's your problem. Uh, you need more people in Vermont. And that's why we've taken a lot of the steps that we have uh, so, uh, while it's concerning uh, to have a downgrade, uh, from my standpoint, uh, again, it, uh, it, it reinforces the fact that we need to take charge of this. We need to bring more people into Vermont, be more welcoming, uh, satisfying the workforce challenges we have, uh, and at the same time, uh, I believe once we do that, and, and the legislature was a great partner uh, this past year, in doing that, taking steps uh, towards that approach. The more we, the more we prove ourselves, uh, I believe that it won't be long before our rating will be uh, going back up to the top rating. And, and I believe that that's, uh, that's attainable as well. Do you have a sense of whether or how this is gonna increase the cost for borrowing and other costs? We, we won't know until uh, we go out to market uh, what the cost will be, uh, but um, so we'll see. We'll see what it is. It, well, it's higher, you're higher risk. Uh, so it's like uh, going to a bank when you're a higher risk, you pay a, a little bit higher uh, uh, rate uh, in, uh, in borrowing costs. So it's the same type of uh, theory here. So we'll see. I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Uh, we're again, the second highest uh, rating.
which is pretty good. And uh, we'll see how the uh, how the market reacts. To that. Yeah, we have a, a debt affordability uh, committee that takes a look at uh, you know what we should be borrowing so we don't get out ahead of ourselves and and we're frugal by nature and we want to uh, to make sure that we we continue to live within our means so uh, we'll rely heavily on them uh, but I believe that we're you know we've leveled out uh, and we shouldn't borrow any more than we need to uh, but uh, but I believe that uh, the rating agencies saw that approach and and look favorably upon a lot of the initiatives, a lot of the approaches that we're taking here in Vermont. And again, I want to give credit where credit's due. The, uh, the, particularly the money uh, committees and the legislature are fully aware of this as well. And uh, we're working together jointly uh, to try and address this uh, so, that, uh, so that we can get back on a solid footing and uh, move in the right direction, which I believe we're doing. You're still expecting a $50 million give or take it looks that way. I haven't received any of the figures, but everything uh, that uh, would lead me to believe that we're right on target to, uh, to having a surplus that we thought we were going to have. It's, uh, it's always concerning when we see a, a rate increase of any sort. And that's why it's really important that we, uh, we focus on this all-payer model that we've, uh, we've moved forward with. Uh, prevention is key. Uh, the healthier we are, uh, the, the lower the cost in the future, the user cost. So uh, I believe, again, we are, uh, we're leading uh, the country in some respects uh, with this all-payer model and, and focusing on prevention. And that will lead to, uh, to maybe uh, fewer costs in the future as well bringing more youth, more people, younger, healthier people into the state will benefit uh, too. It'll increase the, the pool without driving up the cost. So again, it's all hand in hand and, uh, and I believe we're, we're moving in the right direction in that respect. But I'm concerned uh, about the, uh, the rate increases that far exceed uh, the, uh, the uh, increases in, uh, in pay in Vermont. And do you think the Green Mountain Fair Board should allow those I think the Green Mountain Care Board should do their job, and I'm sure that they will uh, come out with uh, whatever they think is uh, is appropriate. But um, we have a we have that independent body uh, that reviews these, and we'll let them do their job, and then we'll see what uh, what they come up with. Drug uh, drive a big part of that. I'm sorry. Drug prices drive a part of that. Uh, we're kind of taking some steps to open the door to importation from Canada. Senator Sanders is going to lead a bus trip to, to uh, Canada later this month. Do you support his efforts to uh, bring Canadian imports? Yeah, well we passed the bill as you remember here in the state uh, and uh, and I do believe that we should be you know at least be treated fairly uh, across the globe. Uh, if we uh, if we're manufacturing here in, in the states and it's being shipped to, to Canada and sold at a a rate lower than than the Americans would pay. I, I don't believe that's right. So, I support uh, I support us moving forward with anything that we can do to reduce the costs on everyday Vermonters. You uh, expressed some concern about the public safety implications of the dropping of the murder charges in Chittenden County. Have you sensed that in conversations with the Department of Mental Health that have either mitigated those concerns or aggravated? Well, no, I think this is an ongoing conversation we need to have, uh, and it highlights the problem uh, that we have. Uh, we need to be proactive. Uh, I think the legislature is engaged at this, at this point. We'll have these conversations in the future. Um, we can't uh, kick this can down the road. We need to address it. So um, we'll, I still don't, uh, the Attorney General is reviewing those cases in particular at this point. I, I don't know where he's going with that. Uh, but, uh, but I think it's, Again, in, in some respects, uh, good news that uh, we're willing to have the conversations about how we can do this better. And, uh, and I believe the legislature will be a willing partner in that regard. Have you been monitoring the status of the two people that no longer face any charges? Um, I, uh, I have, we are, we are monitoring, yes, uh, but, uh, but I haven't, uh, in, 
myself personally been monitoring that note. And, and so do you feel like you have assurances at this point that uh, the oversight of those individuals will uh, resolve any of the public safety concerns? No, I, I don't believe, I, I don't think we've addressed that, uh, to be honest with you, no. I mean, this, it's still, the same problem still exists. You know, there's, there's a point uh, when, and I don't want to talk specifically about the cases, but there comes a point when our, uh, our uh, uh, Department of Mental Health uh, would have to release a certain uh, people if they came to, you know, met, got healthier. And uh, we would have no choice uh, without any court order to keep anyone uh, to release them into either the custody of connect corrections or release them altogether. So that uh, there is that no man's land uh, that still exists, and that's what we have to address in the future. All right, thank you very much for coming out today. Thank you very much for coming as well. Appreciate it.